brewery is a very special place, and, and I always tell everybody nothing sounds or smells like a brewery but a brewery. We have a brand called Celebration Ale where we hang these pillowcase-sized tea bags of hops in the fermenters. It gives you this really wonderful aromatic note to the beer. The downside is, is those tea bags get really cold, um, about 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and they're covered in yeast. So your hands go just numb, you know, pulling them out, and they weigh you know, probably 70 pounds when they're saturated with beer. Those are the memories that you're like, okay, that's making beer, but then when you taste that beer later, totally worth it. Ask any craft beer fanatic about the pioneers of small batch brewing, and they'll surely name Sierra Nevada. What started out with Ken Grossman brewing pale ale and recycled dairy equipment has grown into a bi-coastal operation, producing over 1.1 million barrels of beer a year. As any small uh, business owner would know, it takes a lot of work to actually create the company. And my father was no exception to that. He spent you know, hours and hours and hours at the brewery and my mom would always take us to the brewery to, to see him. So growing up, the brewery was always this really positive thing for me because my dad was there and, and he was good at you know stopping what he was doing to, to play with me. I remember climbing in grain sacks, doing hide and seek. By the age of 15, Brian Grossman had read every book on brewing he could get his hands on. I begged and begged my father for a job. He finally said, okay, you can either work in the brewing side or you can work in the maintenance side. Well, come on, let's go to the brewing side. So my first day, um, I show up and there was two buckets. Uh, I said, all right, let's scrub the fermenter. I said, wait a second, this isn't brewing. I worked through the cellars and then into the brew house and then filtration and packaging, but I was probably 16 or something, uh, give or take, so my first brew. Since then, Sierra Nevada has become America's third largest craft brewery. We're privately held, you know, we're family owned, so we can look at ROIs return on investments of years versus a normal corporation might have a three or four year timeline, we can say, oh, well, this will be good for 10 years, this will be good for 15 years, because we do have the long-term vision on it. Family dinners are pretty, pretty fun. Everyone wants what's best for the company, but like any family, um, you know, there's difference of opinions, there's different uh, points of view. We say family owned, operated, and argued over on our packaging. Uh, we even argued over putting that on the package. So it's, you know, it's a true family business. I grew up on basically a homestead. My mom would mill our own grain for breads and flowers. A lot of our you know, initial sustainability efforts, recycle and reuse uh, or repurpose, was based out of necessity originally. They are you know, pretty big outdoors people as well, and, and you know, we always want to do what's best for the environment. And they do. Sierra Nevada's Chico, California facility produces nearly 80% of its own renewable energy with the help of 10 microturbines, a bank of Tesla batteries, and over 10,000 solar panels. But wait till you see their East Coast pad. Cheers. 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 Welcome to North Carolina. Thank you. Sustainability is such a part of the culture here at Sierra Nevada. Everywhere you look across the brewery, there's reminders of sustainability. The Sierra Nevada Mills River Brewery is the physical manifestation of their bigger than beer philosophy. From spent grains and malt trains, rainwater cisterns and bioswales, recycling and compost, bike parking and EV charging, if it's sustainable, they're doing it. And they're doing it with zero waste. We knew that we needed to have a facility on the East Coast to basically get beer to all of our East Coast customers. Um, cuts down on our carbon footprint and makes us a more sustainable operation in general. And we did it. And we were the first production brewery in the country to achieve platinum lead certification. On November 15, 1980, Ken Grossman brewed his first Sierra Nevada beer, a stout that his son would brew on the opposite coast 35 years later, under a roof of starlight because rain had slowed construction, but nothing could stop the beer. Yeah, we were designing the brewery for years before. Well, I've known this brewery longer than I've known my wife. I spent my honeymoon on the phone closing this deal. Things were moving fast. Sierra Nevada was shipping beer out to every state in America out of one single brewery. We did see the fact that we were growing at a pretty good rate and we were gonna run out of capacity. So we made the decision to build the East Coast facility and then the hunt was on for the perfect spot. We were narrowing it down, narrowing it down. We need 
10,000 head of cattle to eat our spent grain, access to skilled workforces, culture that fits you know, who we are. We didn't want to be within 50 miles of another small craft brewer. We didn't want to be the big 800 pound gorilla coming in. That's just not who we were. So Western North Carolina was cut off the list because there's already such a great small brewing scene here. We actually narrowed it down to Knoxville, Tennessee, and we got word from our friends in Asheville saying, why weren't we considered? And so Sierra Nevada became the second largest landowner on the historic French Broad River. The whole property is just over 200 acres, wow. and about 26 of those acres were developed for building the brewery. This is Delia Springs, it's a natural creek, and it feeds right into the French Broad River. And when you're driving up on property, you might not even notice that you're driving over a bridge. A million dollar bridge. Preserving the natural springs required quite the engineering feat. And, as legend has it, a lot more money than originally anticipated. The details really matter. You know, if you've got passion and pride the details are, are easy because you're going to want to get them right. We ended up milling all the lumber on the site that we took off, which is like 400,000 board feet of timber. And where the brew house is sitting was a poplar grove. So we made that ceiling the poplar that was growing right there. We've always been into trying to keep everything as local as we possibly can. We try to grow as much of our own food with our restaurants on site. We're growing the state mushrooms that we serve in our restaurant. We added beehives as well. I added chickens and I just added some sheep and donkeys to the property and an orchard actually. I really wanted to make the entrance to the brewery an oasis. I wanted someone just to stop driving and go, what is that? I wanted the front gates to be you know, basically like Alice falling down the rabbit hole. And that wander through, so if you look, there's a hard tree line and that's that wander. And then the, the big reveal, as we call it, the analogy that I was going with was in The Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy opens the door and it goes from black and white to color, and it's just like, whoa. A brewery like this one, it's about three to one. It's about 2.7 to one gallons of water in to beer out. So we really do focus on water and our water integrity a lot. Most of it is about just making sure you minimize what you're using, you know, creating on-site power generation, wastewater digestion on-site, which creates methane. That methane we can actually put in our micro turbines to actually make our own power on-site. So all those little things add up. And that's sort of what sustainability, the essence of it is, is if you take care of all those little 1% things, they do you know, ultimately add up to be something big. People always ask, where do we get started? And the first thing is, get started. You know, just start doing something. Let's go check out some hops. So you can just uh, reach in here, grab a handful. Are you serious? I can just Yeah. Ah. So when we get the hops uh, directly from Yakima, they come to us in bales. Right. And it's just a huge brick. And they're about uh, about 200 pounds a piece. Rub them like this. Okay. And we'll break them up. We're going to smell that. Yeah. Magnum is known for being real piney. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm in like walking through an old growth forest. This is a variety called Idaho 7. Just in this room, you've got Oh, I don't know, 20 varieties. And they're all gonna be as different from each other as these two are okay. from each other. And so and how in the world do you figure out how to blend them? Well, it's experience. Scott was actually the brewer that trained me in our system. We're, we're learning a lot all the time. It never stops. And that's one of the beautiful things about the industry is because you, you really have no reason or any excuse to be bored at all. <laughs> Anytime at all. That's just not, not happening. Beers are sort of like your children. You know, they're all unique and they're all different. You love them all. And I don't just drink my beer either. I like the effort that other people put in their products as well. What was your first Sierra Nevada beer? Hell, hell, absolutely. This beer undoubtedly started the craft beer revolution in the first place. For the longest time, brewers, uh, larger brewers, were selecting hops um, for sort of their um, non-unique characteristics. So there would be some varietals that would be thrown away because it smelled like you know, 
a melon or a pineapple, and mm -hmm. today, you know, brewers can't get enough of it. It was in the 70s when, when Oregon State bred Cascade, and my father fell in love with that hop and very proudly mm -hmm. showcased it in, in his pale ale because of its nice piney citrusy characteristics, and it still blows me away, this, mm. the balance of that beer. By today's standards, I mean, yeah. it's, it's incredibly simple. Simple is good. And our yeast <laughs> has been copied and, and bred by a lot of other people. And bottle conditioned. Bottle conditioned, um, yep. That's very rare mm -hmm. in, in the business. So that's where we'll add a little bit of yeast and a little bit of sugar back to the bottle. Yeah, it's it's the, the Desert Island beer. Cheers to that. Cheers. You know, we joke and say that we took about 40 years to perfect making our beers crystal clear and stable. and. We had to unlearn it all to, to start making <laughs> hazy beers. Initially, it's quite easy to make a beer hazy, but to make it hazy for a long time, when you're beer. shipping it all the way to wherever, that's very, very challenging. But you know, as Scott was saying, that's the fun part about making beers, you know, mm. the, the palate variety that you get out there is huge. You know, I guarantee I can find a beer that you like. Yeah. It's because there's thousands of different flavors. And this is a prime example of that. Next up, we have um, kind of going back in time oh, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, Not yeah. as far as pale ale, but torpedo. This was based off of our sustainability philosophy as well. Torpedo IPA was a happy accident. Those 70-pound pillowcases full of hops for celebration ale, when they opened them up, they found dry hops that weren't being utilized. So they came up with a recirculation method, pumping beer through an old water filter on a wide base that looked like a torpedo. All right. We're rolling. Eventually, when we got it right, we said, boy, that's pretty good. Let's, <laughs> let's put it on in the pub. And you get yeah. this wonderful mm -hmm. aroma from, from the torpedoing process. Yeah, so, people liked it, so we kept making it. Last but not least, Strange Beast. 50% black tea, 50% green tea, if memory serves me correct. There's something called a SCOBY, uh, yeah. which is the symbiotic um, culture, culture of bacteria and yeast. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we actually plated all the different bacteria and yeast that we could find regarding kombuchas, and we made our own scoby you did not. from scratch. I didn't know you could do that. Trying yeah. to get a very, very specific flavor profile. I love making beer, don't get me wrong, um, but there's more to um, the drinker now. I mean, people are constantly changing. You know, all these products are coming out from all over the place, and I like that sort of innovation. Building stuff's fun. The harder the project, the bigger the reward when yeah. you finally figure it out. Uh, and, and that's really satisfying. The reasons behind sustainability, and you know, we do it for our kids just as much. I think if you can show a successful business with successful policies and programs, you know, you can be sort of a, a beacon for people to say, look, you know, that's why Sierra's doing it that way. And you can show people that you, know, you can run a successful company um, while keeping good environmental ethics. That's the why, the why behind all this stuff is just fun. <laughs> <laughs>